This is the Proton Guru video practice for topic 1.9 and 10. These problems will give you practice on identifying acids and bases as well as relating structure to the strengths of an acid or base. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2018 in Lessons 1.9 and 10. You can also find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match those videos with your particular course's textbook at protonguru.com. Our first problem simply asks us to identify the acid and base in this particular reaction. A proton exchange is involved in this reaction. We see that we have a proton here that is no longer on that oxygen. Instead, it's gone to this oxygen. The acid will be the proton donor, and the base will be the proton acceptor. So it's relatively straightforward in this type of case to identify the acid and base. This is the acid that gives the proton. This is the base that accepts the proton. Here's a similar problem, and again, we're exchanging a proton. This carbon has a proton to start, but not in the finish. This nitrogen has two protons to start and three in the products. That makes it easy to identify the acid, which is the thing that supplies the proton, and the base, the entity that accepts the proton. Here's the same question, but now we see that we're not exchanging a proton in this case. So we're going to need to use a different definition of acids and bases that is not specific to proton exchange. Specifically, we'll need to use the Lewis definition of an acid and base. In that definition, a Lewis base is a lone pair donor, and a Lewis acid is a lone pair acceptor. So we're going to have to look at the arrow pushing that's needed to affect the change to find which is the acceptor and which is the donor of the lone pair. We see that the aluminum needs to pick up a chlorine and a negative charge. So the arrow pushing necessary to accomplish that will be, of course, break the carbon-chlorine bond and donate the electron pair to the aluminum to make it a negatively charged tetrachloroaluminate at the end. We can then apply the Lewis definition to say the base is the one that is the lone pair donor, in this case the chlorine-containing species, and the acid is the lone pair acceptor, in this case the trichloroaluminum species. And now that we've reviewed the Lewis acid base definitions, we can answer a question like this, asking which are Lewis acids and which are Lewis bases. Well, again, the definition has to do with accepting or donating a lone pair, so we better draw out the Lewis structures to identify which of these may have lone pairs to give and which may need a lone pair. So I've gone ahead and drawn out the Lewis structures, as you see here. And looking at the periodic table to do that, we identify three of these species as having only six valence electrons. An atom that has fewer than the octet of electrons in its valence shell will be able to accept a pair of electrons such as the gallium, the carbon, and the boron. Those should be Lewis acids. On the other hand, the anionic oxygen here has lone pairs to give, as does this neutral nitrogen. And that allows us to pretty easily label these as Lewis bases, the lone pair donors, or Lewis acids, the lone pair acceptors. Another type of question that we can address using the knowledge from lessons 1.9 and 10 are to identify the most acidic site on a molecule. And here we're given a series of protons in this large molecule and we're asked which would be the most acidic. So if we added a base, which would be the first one to come off? Well, the most acidic site will leave the most stable anion or the most stable conjugate base behind. In this case, all the proton choices are on carbon atoms and they differ primarily in the hybridization. So we should assign the hybridization, and since we're really trying to find the most stable anion, the most stable conjugate base, we should redraw these as the conjugate base forms. If we do that, we see that if we took this proton off, we'd have this anion left behind, this anion if we took this proton off, etc. And they differ in their hybridizations. We have an sp hybridized, some sp3 hybridized ones, and an sp2 hybridized one. So the question then becomes, how does the difference in hybridization influence the anion stability? Well, we learned in lesson 1.6 that the hybridization influences the electronegativity. The more s character an atom has, the more electronegative it is. So in this case, the sp hybridized carbon is the most electronegative. The sp3 hybridized would be the least electronegative. So now we know that these different carbons differ in their electronegativities, and now the question becomes, how does electronegativity influence anion stability? Well, all else being equal, the more electronegative anionic atom, the more stable is the anion. So this is the most stable anion, the most stable conjugate base, and that means that in our starting material, that would be the most acidic proton, because taking it off leaves the most stable anion or weakest conjugate base behind. 
So just to recap this answer, you need to redraw your compounds as their conjugate bases and find the most stable conjugate base. The most acidic site or the most acidic molecule will be the one that produces the most stable anion as its conjugate base. Another common type of problem to apply those bits of knowledge we talked about in the previous problem are ranking problems. So here we are asked to rank from the strongest to the weakest acid. And again, we should redraw these as in the conjugate base forms to find the most stable one. That would be the strongest acid. So if we take a look at these conjugate bases that I've drawn down here, we need to think about the different structural aspects that influence stability. The size of the anionic atom, the electronegativity, etc. Here, all these atoms that have the minus charge on them are the same size. Carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are all in the second row. So we can't use the difference in size to differentiate them but we can check for differences in electronegativity. Oxygen is more electronegative than a nitrogen or a carbon, so it's going to have the most stability. So the strongest acid is the one that produced that most stable conjugate base. But the electronegativity of an sp hybridized carbon is about the same as the electronegativity of a nitrogen that's sp3 hybrid. So how do we break that tie? Well, we have to look at resonance and inductive effects. Well, neither of these anions that we're now tied, that we're trying to compare, have resonance. So we have to look at the inductive effect. And that means what attractive or repulsive forces might exist that will make one or the other more or less stable. Well, since the nitrogen is sp3 hybridized, it has a tetrahedral geometry. That means that the bond angles will be 109.5. In the sp hybridized carbon, the angle between the lone pair holding the negative charge and the other side of the bonds with the sp hybridized carbon is 180 degrees. There's much less repulsion in the case where you have a 180 degree angle between the bonding pair and the lone pair than you would see in the more repulsion with the 109.5 degree angle between those. That means that this would be less stable and the carbon centered anode would be more stable. And that allows us to rank our acids. We found that the oxygen had the greatest electronegativity. That's the strongest acid. We've now discovered that the nitrogen-centered anion is the least stable, so that means that it's conjugate acid. The species here is the weakest acid. And then we have this one sitting right in the middle, this alkyne. Now let's rank this different series from strongest to weakest acid. We take a look at these, and we need to redraw them as the conjugate bases. One way you can do this if you're doing a test is to just scribble out the proton. You don't have to try to redraw all these structures when you're trying to save time on a quiz or an exam or something. You can really quickly produce the conjugate bases that way. And now the first thing you assess is, well, what atom has the negative charge on it? Well, it's oxygen in all these cases. So they're all the same size. They're also the same electronegativity. They have the same hybridizations. So we should check for resonance. Well, three of these have resonance. Remember that a really quick way to check for resonance is to see if there's a charge on an atom right beside a pi bonded atom. So we see pi bonds here, 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 and here. But the pi bonds are not present in the atom right next to the charged atom in this case. So there's no resonance. That's going to be the least stable conjugate base. So its conjugate acid is the weakest acid. So now we have to rank the stability of these other species that do have resonance. So how do we do that? Well, in the case of this species here, we see that delocalization of the negative charge is possible onto two other oxygens. We could move it like this onto this oxygen, or we could move that negative charge by resonance onto that other oxygen. Now that's in contrast to the second case over here where we can delocalize the electrons only onto one other oxygen. In this case, we can only move the negative charge onto carbon atoms because there are no other oxygen atoms in the molecule. Now, oxygen is better at stabilizing a negative charge than carbon, so both of these cases provide more stability for the anion than does the case with the carbon. The one where you can delocalize onto two oxygens is going to be a little more stable than the one where you can delocalize onto only one oxygen. And that allows us to rank all of these. The weakest acid had no resonance. The strongest acid had the most resonance onto the oxygens. Second strongest acid, resonance onto only one. And the third strongest had resonance, but only onto carbon atoms. Here's another ranking question. Rank from strongest to weakest acid. And again, we want to start by redrawing them as the conjugate bases. Again, you could just scribble out the hydrogen and draw a negative charge on your paper. I've drawn them out here. And we see that all of these have 
the minus charge on the oxygen, and all of them have the same type of resonance from the carboxylate here. And when all those things tie, the size, electronegativity, and resonance effects, we need to look for the inductive effects. Remember, inductive effects are simply looking for repulsion or attraction that might stabilize or destabilize these molecules. If I just have a hydrocarbon branch, remember that bonding pairs repel lone pairs. We learned that in valence shell electron pair repulsion theory way back in general chemistry or high school chemistry. But if we have a positive charge, positive charges attract negative charges. So anywhere where there's a polar bond indicated by these partial charge symbols, you would have an attraction from that partial positive to the negative charge on the oxygen. So the one with repulsion is the least stable conjugate base. It should be the conjugate base of the least acidic conjugate acid. But now we have three of these that have attractive forces. So how do we tell which attractive force is the greatest? More attraction is more stable. Well, the most polar bond, in this case carbon fluorine, will have the most positive charge induced on this carbon. Greater positive attracts the negative, so more attraction, and more attraction is more stable. Chlorine is the next most electronegative after fluorine among the choices we have. Second most polar, second most amount of positive charge, second most amount of attraction, therefore the second most stable. And then the bromine is less electronegative than chlorine, induces less positive charge, third most polar, third most stable. So our weakest acid had some repulsion there, we had the greatest attractive force there, second most, second strongest, third most, third strongest.